Hey everybody, welcome to homerecordingmadeeasy.com, visionrecordingstudios.com, and here on my YouTube channel. Today we have another Universal Audio Plugin Series plugin review. In this week, we're going to take a look at the Neve 88RS Channel Strip Collection. And the reason why I wanted to do this is this um, uh, Neve 88RS Channel Strip has just been re released in 2015. And if you take a look at the two images on your screen in front of you here, you can see to the left, this is the new uh, Neve 88RS Channel Strip emulation by Universal Audio, which was released in May of 2015, which was just a few days ago of the recording of this video. Prior to that, they released the um, the first version of the Neve 88RS, which is now known as the Legacy model, in around 2004-2005 on the UAD1 platform, which I've been using this particular channel strip for years, and I absolutely love it. <clears throat> Out of all the channel strips and all the consoles um, that I uh, that I use more than anything else, I use the Neve, and the Neve 88RS is an awesome, awesome, awesome channel strip, um, and I'm so happy that they re-released it in 2015, and there is quite a few differences between the two, and I'd like to share that with you today, and then bring you into the DA and show you a couple of sound examples on some drums, some bass, and some acoustic guitar so you can hear what this new uh, 88RS channel strip uh, can do for you. So let's um, move over to the next slide. And like all of my Universal Audio plug-in reviews and first looks, I like to do kind of a little of a history lesson and facts section just to kind of show you where the uh, 88RS and all the Universal Audio uh, plugins, their vintage uh, hardware counterparts come from, kind of a little bit of a history lesson. I think it's important when you start getting into um, – using vintage plugins um, in your DAW to kind of understand a little bit about the hardware and where it came from. So without further ado, the console was designed by Robert, by Robin Porter and it was introduced by Neve in 2001. The design was uh, for this console it was to have more scoring capabilities and features, hence the S and the 88RS. The S stands for scoring. It was really more designed and built for the film industry and for people who create, uh, who do scoring for, for movies and TV and such. The 88RS has a surround recording and mixing capabilities, which is one of the first consoles of its time to have uh, that many capabilities to do surround sound types recording. The 88RS is used in Abbey Road Studios, Ocean Way, and Skywalker Sound Studios in Los Angeles. So the, some of the biggest names uh, studios in the, in, in the world use the 88RS. The 88RS is known for its wide open sound where the harder you push the console, the more brilliant it sounds. And it's almost impossible to, to distort. So one thing about the Neve and that Neve quote unquote air quotes uh, sound is that it has a real nice open top end and a real nice thick low. And it doesn't sound muddy. It sounds real nice and wide and open and brilliant. Um, and you, the harder you push it, the better it, it, it loves it. And it has a ton of headroom in the, in the hardware. And the, um, and the, and the plug-in is no different. Universal Audio released the 88RS channel strip, which is now known as the Legacy version, in around 2004-2005. I'm not sure of the exact year, and it's nowhere on Universal Audio's website. I've checked into that, but I remember using this plug-in way back on the UAD1 platform um, when, it, when I first got into UAD, and that's probably around that time frame. The new 88RS collection was remodeled in 2015 to include the preamp section and to take advantage of its unison technology, as well as using upsampling technology to emulate the circuit non-linearities in both the EQ and the dynamic section. This means that the 88RS will add more color and harmonic distortion to your sound, but it also uses more DSP power. So we'll talk about the Unison technology in a second and what's unique to Universal Audio, which is one of the, which is one of the reasons why I love Universal Audio um, so much. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the difference is really between the new version and the old version, the legacy version. Let's go over to the next slide. Here's a, here's a photo of the, uh, of the new version. Um, and then if we um, go over here, here's an actual um, photo of the of the 88 rs and skywalker Studios. so this is a big console it's a beautiful a beautiful piece of equipment um and if you go back and you want to see the differences between uh the two here um the one on the left being the new the new version um the real differences between these two is that back in 2004 2005 and back in the days of the uad1 um, platform where the dsp technology just wasn't in, invented yet to be have as much horsepower as it does today on the UAD2 platform, that when the Neve was modeled back on the in the legacy uh, version, which is the one on the right, the compressor and the dynamic section, or the compressor and the EQ section were modeled, but the preamp section 
um, and the output section was not. So this may, because there wasn't the ability to have enough DSP power to be able to emulate all of that. So although the, the legacy model sounds great, it's a lot more of a transparent sounding type of a, of a, of a channel strip. It doesn't have the color and the grit and the, and the non-linearities uh, of the analog circuitry um, as the 2015 version. So in 2015, they went back and they remodeled it because now the technology is such, and Universal Audio has been doing this a lot longer, where they went back, and they're the only company, by the way, that has um, an exclusive license to the Neve 88RS. So uh, they're, they're, this is licensed by Neve and that they're partners with Neve in order to, to, to do this type of stuff. So it's as accurate as it can be. Um, where now in 2015, they went back and they actually modeled the preamp section of the of the desk as well as the output section um, and redid the, the dynamic section and the EQ section to where it's included all those non-linearities and the non-linearity it really what that really does is as the signal runs through the this analog circuitry the non-linearities and the harmonic distortion and everything that happens when it, when a signal when a sound is running through that circuitry creates a nice pleasing warm harmonic distortion color tone and vibe to your signal it's it's the it's the secret ingredient to why analog hardware sounds the way it does and why digital sounds so sterile compared to it and universal audio has done a magnificent job uh in in recreating or re-emulating uh this particular plugin so again if we uh, take a close look here and we're going to go into the daw in a few minutes and actually use this but here's the uh, up and close look at the um at the uh, new channel strip. And again, there's a lot of buttons and a lot of push pull things and it looks kind of overwhelming and confusing, but once you use it a little bit, it's actually quite simple. If you look at the top left-hand corner, this is the preamp section now. And the way the signal flows, it flows <clears throat> coming into the plug-in through the preamp section where you have a line and a mic uh, selection where you can either uh, click, most times I use the mic uh, input um, and you have a, 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 you could see the red knob underneath it. You have kind of a, um, a trim control or a, a gain adjustment there. And you can also uh, switch that off to the line. If you are say wanted to emulate like a bass guitar being plugged directly into the desk, you can press the line input and, and use the adjustment there. And again, they, they sound, both sound great. Both have a little bit of a sound difference and a little sound characteristic difference. Right underneath that, you'll see the filtering section and, and the 88RS has a wonderful low and high cut filtering section. Um, and the signal will run through that next, and you can do some filtering there. And then beneath that is the dynamic section. On the left-hand side of the dynamic section, you have the gate expander. Um, and you also, on the right to that, you have the uh, compression limiter. <clears throat> so on the on the compression side, the red knob there, you have a, a, a gain adjustment, a makeup gain. You have a push-pull, and we'll, we'll look at this more up close in, inside the DAW, but you have a push-pull uh, section underneath that gain knob there in red, which is the knee. HN stands for hard knee, so when it's pulled, it's when the push-pull is pulled out, it's a hard knee. When it's pushed in, it's a soft knee. But directly below that, you have a threshold uh, control. Directly, directly below that in green, you have the ratio, and it goes from a one-to-one -one ratio to limiting, which is probably around 20 to 1 and everything in between. And again, you have a push-pull knob for a fast, a fast attack, slow attack setting. Even in, its fa even in its slow attack, it's more kind of a, a fast medium attack. Um, and you can read the manual for the exact milliseconds, but it's this desk is not known for a super slow attack. It does have a quite a fast attack. Um, and then under that, you have a release, um, a release uh, adjustment from 0.01 milliseconds to all the way to three seconds, and then you can click it past three seconds into an auto release mode. I mean, in the center section of the plugging, you have the EQ section. Um, in the top, in the light blue, you have um, a, a par parametric EQ where it goes from 1.5 kilohertz all the way to up to 18K. Um, you have the high Q button, and when that's illuminated, that, that is kind of uh, narrows the Q. When it's not illuminated, it's more of a broad Q, it's fixed. Um, and then you have the, um, the gain adjustment next to that. Uh, underneath and towards the middle in the more lighter blue section, you have a full parametric EQ with a Q adjustment. Um, and again, it goes from uh, 800 hertz to 9K. And then in the darker blue underneath that, you have uh, from 120 uh, hertz to 2K. Again, fully parametric with an adjustable Q. And then towards the bottom in black, you have the, kind of the opposite of what's happened at the top of the EQ section. You have the low uh, frequency section from 33 hertz to 440 hertz. Again, you have the high Q button, which will narrow the curve. If it's um, disengaged, it'll be more of a broad Q, but it's fixed. And then underneath that, you'll have the power switch 
to the top right hand part of the plugin. You'll have the metering section. Uh, the first metering, which is in that uh, light green color, is the gate expander. And then to the right of that is the compressor and the, the compressor limiter. And then what's new to this particular version of the plugin to the right of the compressor limiter, you have the UV of the output section, the levels, the output meter. And then you have the output fader, which says it's modeled. It's a PNG fader. Um, and you can use that when you increase the, the input on the preamp, you can compensate to level match the plugin by pulling down the fader. Or you can use, and that will, not only will that drop the overall volume level, but it also will change the harmonic distortion characteristics. And if you want, and it'll give you, the more you pull down the fader, a little less uh, coloring of the sound that you'll get. Or you can use underneath that, which I think this is a great addition, which is not on the hardware unit. You have the output gain um, dial at the very bottom, bottom right hand corner, and it says clean in parentheses. And what that means is, let's say you, you, you bump up the preamp and you turn up the volume. Well, now you can compensate. Instead of turning down the fader, the physical PNG fader, you can leave that at unity. And you can use the output gain. And the reason why it says clean is because what happens is you'll turn down the output gain, but it's not going to change the color or the tone or the uh, harmonic distortion characteristics uh, that the fader is giving you when you have it up at unity if that makes sense so you can leave the fader at unity and you could turn down the clean volume output pot and that'll still give you all the color and tone of using the PNG fader because the PNG fader was actually modeled and there was a sound and a characteristic to that cir circuitry and if you want to leave that in play to give the, the maximum amount of warmth and color and nonlinearity distortion you can keep that at unity and use the output uh, pot at the bottom right hand corner to uh, to adjust the, the overall volume level so that's a pretty cool feature so that is kind of the lay of the land here of the of the 88RS again it looks confusing but it really isn't and once you use it a bunch it's really uh, a pretty simple uh, thing to use and again, I've used this for many, many years, so I know it very, very well, and I'm really, really pleased with what they did um, to this particular plugin. But let's talk about this Unison technology and what is this. And this is relatively new for Universal Audio. And Universal Audio, when you um, and I and again, I don't quote me on the year. I want to say the Unison technology has been around since the Apollo's uh, interface units have come out. And I want to say they've been out now maybe three years. If we're in 2013, maybe or 15, maybe 2012 ish. I could be off a year one way or the other. But when you buy one of the Apollo interfaces, whether it's the uh, the rack mounted unit or the Apollo, I think it's the twin, which is the desk desktop unit. And now in the spring of 2015, they have these new Apollo 8s in different new, and they're always coming out with these new types of uh, preamps. So um, depending on when you're watching this video, they may, they may, very, may very well be more hardware than what I'm mentioning to you now. But in these, in their Apollo interfaces, they have what's called Unison technology. <clears throat> and what makes this so unique is, yes, it acts as a Firewire and or Thunderbolt uh, interface with preamps on the back. So you plug your microphones and or instruments into um, the interface and it, it acts just like any other interface does. And if you want to know more about the Apollo units, go search my YouTube channel, go under the playlist section, and I have a whole... Uh, 30 or 40 minute video on the hardware of the Universal Audio um, system and I talk in depth about the Apollo <clears throat> but what you also get um, as part of the interface is you get this software this console software that you're seeing right now on your screen and what this allows you to do is it allows you to, for the first time to record through plugins okay without any latency into your DAW Okay, so let me say that again. When you normally, before you would have this technology, if you ever tried to use, and I don't care what DAW you're using, and I don't care how fast your computer is, but the slower your computer, the worse off this problem is. Where let's say you're recording um, a vocal, and you wanted to uh, record with reverb or delay or compression uh, plugins on your inserts of your vocal track. Okay, what would happen? You would get what's known as latency. And what latency is, it's the time that from the time that the singer is speaking or singing into the microphone, but by the time that the sound goes through the microphone, through the cable, into the interface, into the DAW, back out of the DAW, and into the headphones, that, that, that time difference is known as latency. And if you ever tried to record through plugins in a DAW as an insert, whether it be compressors, EQs, reverbs, or delays, or whatever the effect is, 
you'll get this kind of a delay effect in the in the in the headphones, right? And that is latency. And so what you're forced to do, or what we've always been forced to do up till now, is you'd record vocals or any instrument for that matter completely dry, and then you would add the effects later. Sometimes if you had a studio that had an outboard piece of gear, like a little outboard reverb unit, you can put some reverbs in the in the headphones for the singer, but you couldn't record effectively through um, any kind of plugins, especially the vintage style plugins that take up a lot of computing power. The, the more computing power that the plugin would, would require, the more latency you would get. Since then, Universal Audio has come up with this Unison technology, which allows you now to record through this piece of software, okay, with plugins on the way into the DAW. And what you're monitoring in your headphones is you're monitoring the software here, in this case, the console software, you're not monitoring the DAW, the sound coming out of the DAW. So for example, this is, this happens to have, uh, this on channel one here, um, they have it, it, this looks just like a DAW sort of, it has kind of an input uh, section and here's my inserts. And if I click on my inserts, I can go over to my, uh, let's see, um, the Neve, uh, channel strip. Okay. So, oh, that's the SSL. Sorry. Uh, let me go over, let me remove this, remove, where is my Neve? Where is my Neve channel strip? So you can record through plugins, uh, 88 RS. Okay. So in our case, we could record if we were recording guitar, vocals, whatever, through the Neve 88 RS, and we could record that recorded sound into our DAW already processed. So you can be actually recording through a Neve desk or an API or the or any one of their other uh, Unison technology plugins and they're coming out with more than more and more of them as of this recording they have the 88RS the API channel strip the Neve 1073 preamp um, and the I think the U UA 610A and 610B and they're always coming out with more and more so you can actually record through this channel strip into your DAW Okay, which is, that's a breakthrough in technology. Universal Audio was the first company to be able to do this. And there's no latency because you're monitoring not the sound in your DAW. You're monitoring the sound through this, uh, this, this console software. You can either record the actual recorded sound or if you want to record drawing, you just want to monitor this. So you can put like a, a, Neve, a Neve channel strip there. And then let's say you wanted to put a, a delay. Uh, you know, let's say I wanted to put, a, I don't know whatever, I have the Cooper time cube and I want to put a little bit of delay on the vocal, but I just wanted to do it so the singer can hear it in the he or she's headphones. We don't have to record that signal. We can record it dry. Um, we, could, we can either record over here in the bottom right hand corner insert effects. I can either, I can either record the insert effects to my DAW or I can just monitor it. Okay, so I can monitor it. They'll hear the effect in their headphones, but the signal will be dry going into the DAW and I could do my processing afterwards. Or I can record it directly to tape, so to speak, which is what most people and I tend to do, is make a decision, commit to a sound, and record it directly to tape as it were. Okay, so that's what's great about the Universal Audio and the Apollo products is not only do you get some fantastic vintage uh, analog emulations, but you also get this ability to do uh, with their Unison technology where you can record through the console software into your DAW with no latency, and that is a first. So that makes the Universal Audio system in itself, even though it's a pretty pricey investment, it's a great investment because it can grow with your studio, and they're coming out with more and more of these Unison technology plugins where you'll be able to eventually record with all of their plugins, which is which is fantastic. So let me just close the, the console here. So that's what the Unison technology is in a nutshell. So now let's go over to the um over to the to the to the DAW and let's pull up the 88 RS and let's take a listen to it and see we're in a couple of different examples of how we can use it. So come right back and take a listen um, to the 88 RS Neve new channel strip program by Universal Audio. Okay, welcome to our DAW session here. And today we're going to look at this new 88RS um, Neve uh, channel strip. And we're going to look at it on um, a drum bus, kind of a drum stem, uh, a bass, and acoustic guitar, just to kind of give you a couple of different flavors of what this thing can do. So here is the up close and personal look at this again. We already rocked through the controls on the presentation slide a little bit earlier. So we're just going to jump right into this and I'll kind of talk you through it. So right now we're just playing back a drum section here. Okay, and I'm going to turn on the channel strip. 
and instantly you can hear as soon as I turn that thing on and, and have the mic preamp on the preamp section of this instantly you hear some vibe and some <clears throat> and some mojo happening with that track just by turning it on and off without even the compressor's not on the EQ's not on nothing's on listen to what happens when I just turn this off and on off okay so instantly you hear the volume pickup so again we can use the level match the plugin we can either do this with the with the png fader here but as we said a little earlier i like to keep the png fader up at unity because i want to get that harmonic distortion and non-linearity kind of vibe in my signal that tone and i'm going to use and i'm going to and, and if you turn this down you get a little less color and a little less vibe here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn it down via this this uh, output pot down here Okay, so now we're kind of level matched. First thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna crank up the mic input a little bit and we're gonna look at the UV meter here. I'm gonna drive it a little bit and see what that does. Turn down the output to compensate. You can instantly hear how this is brings the sound to life. So by pushing this and pushing it kind of hard, actually, and the more you push this, eventually you'll start to see the over overload light clip here. We could turn this down a little bit just to show you that what happens. I'll pull it down here. You can start to hear it at the store. You can start overdriving the circuit. Which sometimes that might be desirable. You have to play around with it. You can turn this on a little more. So again, just by using the preamp section, you automatically start to hear a nice top end on the cymbals and on the snare. It just adds a lot of character to the sound. This is amazing because this was not part of the legacy version, the old version, as we said earlier. That's one of the things that makes this new particular plugin version of it so worth the money if you have the 88 rs legacy version in your universal audio user i think you get it you get a discounted price on this when you purchase it because you already have the original which is the first time i think universal audio has done that because this this plugin's been around for quite a long time but they're giving you a special break on it and you can get like a hundred bucks off the price um, at least as of this recording of this video um, so well worth it just for the preamp section alone it's worth it because the legacy version, as I said, doesn't have the same character. It's a lot more transparent sounding. Still sounds great. Uh, better than not using any channel strip at all. But this, you can really hear the difference in the sound and what it adds to the, to the, to the tonal palette of the signal. So now let's move over to the cut to the low cut high cut section. So again, here's the filtering section, and these are push pull knobs. So when you pull this out, it becomes now you can see the little knob pulling out of the desk <laughs> that uh, activates it. So let's just play back, and this is our low cut filter. In here, 315 hertz. Very musical. And this is on a drum bus, so we're only gonna roll up around maybe 40 hertz. And you can roll off the highs if you wanted to. Goes from 7.5K to 18K. You can hear what that does. Okay, we're gonna leave that one off. Now here's our compressor section. So we're gonna go ahead and engage the compressor by doing that. 
And again, we have release. We have a release down here at the bottom. And you want to watch over here at the top right hand corner the low cut, uh, low low uh, limiter start slash compressor uh, UV uh, <clears throat> LED meter here. So we're gonna go with kind of a quick release here. And we're going to go with about, I don't know, two to three, about a two to one ratio to 2.5 to one ratio. We're going to go with a fast attack again by push pulling this LED here. You see the little green knob pushing in and out when it's in or depressed. It's a slow attack or yeah, slow attack. Pull it out. It's a fast attack. And again, even on its slow attack setting, it's still pretty fast. And then we have a uh, threshold control and you can push pull this to, to pad it down by 20 dB if it, okay. Um, and then we have a makeup gain here and by pulling out this HN, this is hard knee, soft knee. We'll start with a soft knee and we'll just, uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll just, we'll just crank up the, uh, the threshold or crank down the threshold and get some gain reduction happening here. We can overdo it here. Here we're getting about 10 dB of compression. And do some makeup gain. Bypassed. No compression. Level match it. And bypass the whole channel strip. adds a lot of character a lot of warmth again when you bypass the compressor the filtering and the in the preamp section all at the same time and just shut the plug in off you can hear the difference now let's move over to the eq section here the eq section here is uh enabled by depressing that and the nice thing about this uh, channel strip too is by pressing the p dynamics you can put the eq either before or after the dynamic section in its default mode it is after um, where the signal flow goes again through the preamp, through the filtering, through the dynamic section, then through the EQ section, then to the output section. But if you want to put the EQ before the dynamics, you just press that button and that will put the compressor after the filtering section before the dynamics. That's the same on the legacy model as well. But we're going to keep it after. That's typically what I do unless I'm doing some major uh, EQ uh, sculpting where I'm really doing lots of cuts and lots of boosts because maybe the track wasn't recorded well, then I would sometimes put the EQ before the compressor to kind of get rid of and kind of shape the tone before the compressor kind of pulls it all together. But in this case, I'm going to leave it after. Um, and again, we're on a drum bus here. We're listening to the whole kit here. So I'll uh, boost up a little bit of highs, a little bit of mids, just kind of show you what this thing kind of does. So maybe around uh, 13K or so here, we'll... You can see how much it really, uh, and again, each one of these lines represents about 3 dB. So you have about, uh, what, about 12 dB of, of uh, or 12 dB a cut. And then by using the high Q, you're kind of sharpening the, the, uh, the curve. It's not as broad, it's more of a sharp curve. Or you can use a shelf, and everything above 13K will be, this is a shelving. It's kind of nice sounding, right? Very musical. <clears throat> okay, and then here's our, uh, here's a more full, here's the fully parametric EQ here section where you have an adjustable Q. And from 8, 800 hertz to 9K, we're going to go around this uh, 400 hertz section here in the darker blue with a little bit more of a wider Q. We're going to pull out some of the boxiness, some of that. Oops. Some of that boxiness that you tend to get in uh, drums, overheads, and...
maybe just for giggles here, maybe a little bit of lows on the kick drum, just to just to show you what this can do. You can hear that thumpiness. A little too much, just want to exaggerate that for you. Now bypass the EQ. Before all the EQ. After. Super, super musical. And again, I'm um, just a uh, FYI, if you haven't realized that none of these tracks are processed prior to me putting these plugins here. This is the only plugin in the entire session. This is not a mixed song, not edited in any way. This is just raw recordings. And I did that purposely because I wanted to show you what this can do without having tracks that are already quote unquote pre-processed. So that's kind of the, the, what it does on drums on a drum bus, which is kind of cool. So let's leave that up and let's now, uh, maybe put it on a bass just for the heck of it to show you what it can do there. And we'll bring that in with the drums. As a matter of fact, let's do it with the drums and play, kind of do it in context. Okay, so we'll use the line input this time and not the mic. It's a little bit different tonal characteristic. You can adjust the input here. And the mic is going to be a lot hotter than the line. So if you're switching back and forth, you got to be very careful that you don't blow, you know, you got to be really careful with your speakers here. You can see the UV uh, LED meter here. We could push this a little bit. Okay, and you can just push this thing. It doesn't distort. A ton of headroom. Now let's adjust our output here. Shut this off. Listen to all that character, that warmth. Whoop. Sounds really nice. Got a phase invert button, not that we need that on this. Yeah, do some high cut filter on this just to kind of roll off the real top end. We don't need nothing above 7.5K. We can even roll off a little low end if we didn't want those supersonic lows. See how much it rolls off the low end. Kind of focus that bass a little more. Let me turn down the drums a little bit. Okay, let's do a little bit of compression, shall we? Let's turn on our compressor. Um, let's go ahead and let's uh, do a little bit of a longer release on a bass to get it to really sustain a little bit. Let's do a kind of a, a slow attack here instead of a fast attack. Let's do about a three or four to one ratio. Um, let's start turning up our, down our threshold. Okay, keep your eye on the meter up here in the top right hand corner. Let's see if we get about three to five dB of compression here happening. We'll turn up some makeup gain. Bypass. Really tightens up that bass a lot. Really thickens it up nicely. Now we can go to like a hard knee setting. aggressive setting with the hard knee, a little more aggressive sounding I should say. We can even push the output a little more. I mean look how hard we're pushing that and it's not distorting at all. It just sounds beautiful. The harder you push it the more that harmonic distortion and that non-linearity type of a vibe that we're getting here. Let's bypass the whole plugin now. And then we boosted up our output here, so let's turn down this output here. Oops. Let's 
Sounds sounds wonderful. Wonderful sounding plugin. This they really did a great job on this. Worth every single penny to upgrade to this plugin. So anyhow, let's move over to say acoustic guitar again. Let's do this in kind of the context of the mix here. the mic input this time. Let's push it a little bit. Maybe, maybe a little much. filter. A little bit of compression. A little bit more of a faster release. Do a fast attack to cut down on that transient. on the top end maybe just to see how it sounds So again, very, very musical EQ, very, very musical plug-in, a lot of character, a lot of warmth, a lot of sonic enhancements to the signal, which again is very, very different the more I use this. And I've only played with this for a couple of hours prior to hitting record on this video. It just came out the other day, but very um, different <clears throat> sounding, more vibey for sure than the legacy model, the older model. A um, lot more noticeable difference when you're twiddling with the knobs with the legacy model. Again, because they only modeled the EQ in the dynamic section, you did not get the full effect of what this hardware console was. Again, because due to the lack of the technology back when that was created, this is an amazing upgrade to that. Much more vibrant, much more mojo. I've said that now a bunch of times, but I, I want people who have this legacy model, um, I know they're asking, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth the upgrade? Because a lot of times plugin companies will just keep upgrading and re-releasing plugins just to get more money out of you. And a lot of times um, they're not worth the upgrade. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, this particular plugin is worth the upgrade if you have the legacy model without a doubt. And, and again, you'll get a discount if you've already owned the legacy model of it. If, if you don't and you buy this outright, you're going to get this along with the legacy. Now, before we bring up all three, and I'll bring up all three while I'm kind of talking here, because what we're going to do is we're now going to bypass them all together or, or try to, to uh, so you can hear the full effect of what happens when you uh, put, uh, you know, take all of these away all at the same time. Um, how how much of an effect this this really has. So um, one of the things, again, I talked about a little bit earlier is this plugin does have a lot more latency, you know, on your system. will tax your DSP, your universal audio DSP card, a lot heavier than the legacy model. To give you kind of a little bit of, a, of an example of that, if I, I, when I was using the legacy plugin, I use this all the time and I put this across all of my tracks. In this example, we're just doing it across some buses just as for this tutorial. 
But the way I would use this is if I had a 20 track session, I'd put it on all the in individual tracks, just like I was recording into a real console. Okay, that's the way you really want to try to use this, not just on the stems or on the buses. However, for this tutorial, we're doing it that way. I could have had a 70 or 80 track session, and I've done this before, where I can take the legacy model of this plugin and put it on, on 80 in instances and have still have more DSP power left in my universal audio system. And at that time, all I had was the Apollo quad system, the quad card. Um, and I can put, and I also had um, a universe, uh, a, a, sat a Thunderbolt satellite quad system. So I had, in essence, two quad cards, and I was able to put 80 instances of the legacy model on my session, along with other universal audio plugins that have plenty of DSP power. This plugin, you could never do that with just a quad card. And, and there's a chart that Universal ha Audio has on their website of how many instances you can put on their, on their specific hardware card. So, for example, if you had a quad card, whether it be a PCIe card inside of your computer or um, an Apollo interface, um, you can put X amount of instances of this particular plugin on there before you lose all your DSP power. Um, I can tell you that since I bought this plugin, I actually added an additional satellite um, uh, uh, Thunderbolt satellite system to my existing system, and I added an Octo card. So now at my system, I have two quad cards and an Octo card, which in essence is eight Octo cards in my system. And I can put now, I think, 60 of these Universal Audio new channel strips, these, U these Neve 88RS channel strips across my session and still have DSP power left. So I guess the moral of the story is the legacy model has a lot less DSP usage. So if you don't have a real high end or real expanded system, them and yet and you're not you still only have like a quad or a solo or a, a dual universal audio card you can use the legacy model on the majority of your tracks and then there's some, some on, on some of the key tracks you can use the newer version of it so for example if i had drums bass and vocals and guitars maybe i would use the legacy version on the bass and maybe the drums and then maybe on the guitars if it was an acoustic guitar vocal kind of a song where that was the featured instrument maybe on the acoustic guitar i would use the new version of the 88 rs um and on the vocal okay to give it more of that that more character on the more featured instrument so hopefully that makes sense there are ways you can mix and match the two different versions of this plugin if your system is not powerful enough to be able to put this new version across all of your tracks because it does chew up a lot of dsp power that's one of the disadvantages to these new modeled plugins but the great advantage of it is it mimics the hardware spot on and it sounds like the real thing and it really gives you all those uh, analog goodness that we always talk about um, in the plugin format and, and it's really an end-to-end -end, um, emulation of the desk whereas before there were certain sections of the desk that weren't included as we've talked about a few times now so I'll shut up now play back this section of music and I'm just going to bypass all three consoles and turn them on and off just so you can hear what it's doing overall again we just dialed this in quickly this is not a uh, this is not mixed none of these tracks are processed just just kind of gives you a feel for what this plugin can do when you put it across a drum bus a bass an acoustic guitar completely bypassed. So hopefully that little demonstration right there, uh, if that hasn't sold you on what this plugin can do, then I don't know what else to do for you. <laughs> just, just kidding. But hear the difference between on and off, what happens when you take these three channel strips away and then put them on, what character and vibrant and richness it adds to the sound. And again, these plugins are not exactly level matched. I know people are going to say, well, it sounds a little bit louder when you put the plugins on. Yeah, I'm trying to do this quick and this video is already going way too long. But I really wanted to kind of give you an in-depth look at this because... 
I haven't seen any videos on YouTube about this yet because it's so new. And so I wanted to be one of the first ones to get it out in front of my subscribers because I know a lot of my YouTube subscribers that are watching this since they've been kind of following me on YouTube has gotten involved in Universal Audio. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, and I want to make sure they understand what this plugin can do. And yes, I should be level matching the plugins a little bit more. But put that aside again. I'll start with it off one last time and then we'll fade to black here and I'll turn it on. Listen to what the, the difference in the, in the sonic characteristic of these three tracks are. Just by a little bit of preamp, a little bit of compression, just a touch of EQ here and here. Just, jer just jerking around with this thing, not even really dialing it in. And listen to how it sounds. Okay, so that is the Neve 88RS, the new 2015 uh, from Universal Audio. Um, again, my name is David Vignola at homerecordingmadeeasy.com and visionrecordingstudios.com. Go out to my website, check out what I got going on. I have a lot more tutorials like this. Get on my YouTube channel, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for supporting the YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing. And do me a favor, head over to the Facebook page and give me a, a like over there as well. That really helps drive traffic and helps uh, uh, people get more involved in our little community here. And it, it gives me better and more ideas to create more content for you. So until next time, this is David Vignola with HomeRecordingMadeEasy.com. And I will talk to you all soon. Take care, guys.